Donald Robertson. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brett. It's a pleasure to be on. So you are a psychologist and a philosopher and the author of the latest book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. So I know our listeners are familiar with Stoicism, but I'm curious, how, how did you discover Stoicism? Was your career as a psychologist, is that what led you to Stoicism or was it something else? Well, I'm actually a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist, and I kind of got into stoicism around the same time that I began training in therapy. So really, the whole story started when I was a teenager. My father passed away when I was about 13 years old, and I was kind of searching for meaning. So I started reading lots of self-help books and stuff like that. And I started reading religious texts. I started looking at Christian Gnosticism. And the Gnostics were influenced by Plato and the Neoplatonists. So that got me into reading the classics. And I went to university and studied philosophy. And I was really searching for a way to bring together my interests in self-improvement and philosophy and kind of understanding the meaning of life and all that kind of stuff. And it was only really after I graduated from philosophy that I stumbled across the Stoics. I went back to read more about Neoplatonism and I found a book about Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, by a French scholar called Pierre Hadot. And Hadot focused on identifying the psychological or spiritual exercises that he found in the classics. And I immediately realized that these were similar to techniques that we use in modern psychotherapy. And I kind of had an epiphany and I realized that the stuff that Hadot was talking about in classical philosophy dovetailed very neatly with modern psychotherapy. So I started researching that area. And did, so did you start, it was like a crossover with stoicism into your, your career as a psychotherapist? Yeah. I mean, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy was originally kind of inspired by stoic philosophy. Albert Ellis, who developed this thing called rational emotive behavior therapy or REBT in the 1950s, he was the main precursor or pioneer of modern CBT. And he, was originally a psychoanalyst, but he became disillusioned with Freudianism and psychoanalysis. He kind of gave up on it and tried to start again from scratch, which is, I always think is a really admirable thing for somebody to do in the middle of their career. You know, he thought, I'm going to have to reinvent this. It's not quite working for me. And he'd read the Stoics as a teenager and he started to draw inspiration from Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus in developing this new cognitive approach to psychotherapy. So all cognitive behavioral therapists actually know a famous quote from Epictetus, which we're bound to talk about today, which is, it's not things that upset us, but our opinions about things. And that encapsulates what we call the cognitive theory of emotion, the idea that our emotions are largely, if not exclusively, shaped or determined by certain underlying beliefs. And as soon as we view emotion in that way, it opens up a whole repertoire of therapeutic techniques because we can start asking people what the beliefs are that underlie their emotions. We can heighten their awareness of those and we can start questioning the evidence for and against the beliefs that shape their emotions. So that allows us to do cognitive therapy. And that was normally introduced to clients in a, a simple way, just by teaching them that, that, that quotation from the Stoic Epictetus. Well, let's talk about Stoicism now. You use Marcus Aurelius to explore Stoic ethics and practices. Before we get to his life, because he was the last of the great Roman Stoics. So we're kind of starting at the end there. There's a whole history of Stoicism before that. Can you give us sort of a, a, a sort of a brief thumbnail history of Stoicism? Like where did it start? Who were the founders and all that? Okay, let's compress 500 years of right. history. Right, you can do it. 30 seconds or something, right? Because, well, the first thing is Stoicism lasted five centuries. It was founded in 301 BC by a Phoenician merchant called Zeno of Citium, who was shipwrecked near Athens. And he studied the different philosophies in Athens at the time, and he was particularly inspired by Socrates. So there's a bit of debate about this, but I believe that Stoicism is a Socratic philosophy it's a kind of resurgence of, of the original Socratic philosophy. That's how I think many Stoics saw what they were doing. And Zeno founded this school of philosophy, and it, it continued uh, for many centuries all the way down to Marcus Aurelius. And he'd originally trained as a cynic philosopher, like Diogenes the Cynic in that tradition. And the Stoic school was very egalitarian. Uh, the Stoa Poikile is a, a, a kind of porch or an arcade where he lectured on the edge of the Agora, the Athenian marketplace, where Socrates had taught before him. So it was out in public. And the Stoics taught men and women and Athenian citizens and foreigners and rich and poor. It was much more open 
than other schools of philosophy, which had retreated to the gymnasia, kind of like retreating to the ivory towers. So Socrates had taught in the marketplace. The Stoics basically did the same thing. And you can say the very name of Stoicism kind of implies a philosophy of the street, as it were. It took place out in the marketplace, once again, where Socrates had previously taught. And the Stoics' main idea is that virtue, which we'll, we'll probably come back to and elaborate on more, but the essence of it is that the goal of life is attaining a kind of moral wisdom that improves our character. And it, the Stoics call that arate, or it's usually translated as virtue or excellence of character. So the most important thing in life is a sort of self-improvement that strengthens and improves our character, and it's synonymous with a kind of practical or moral wisdom. And so therefore the Stoics are relatively indifferent to the ups and downs of external fortune, poverty or success, uh, friends and enemies. These things are seen as less important compared to our own strength of character. And how did Stoicism go from Greece to Rome 500 years later? Well, funnily enough, there's a simple explanation for that. They, they, there was a succession of leaders who took over the Stoic school. And one of them, a guy called Diogenes of Babylon in 155 BC, went on an ambassadorial mission from Greece to Rome and along with a couple of other philosophers. And he became a kind of celebrity. The Romans thought it was really interesting that he was bring, bringing Greek culture to Rome for the first time and teaching them about this weird philosophy called Stoicism. And of the, the various philosophers that came to Rome, the Stoics had the biggest impact in a sense, because the Romans felt that it really, Stoicism really resonated with traditional Roman Republican values. And so Stoicism became trendy at Rome. And shortly after that, a famous Roman statesman and general called Scipio Africanus, or Africanus the Younger, became a, a follower of Stoicism and a, a circle, an intellectual circle that surrounded him called the Scipionic Circle, embraced Stoicism. And then that, did, that became a tradition of Roman noblemen, politicians, intellectuals embracing Stoicism all the way down to Marcus Aurelius. So yeah, Cato, Seneca, other examples of yeah. statesmen and um, philosophers. Well, did I mean, maybe we can get this in a little bit later, but I imagine did Stoicism change from when it went from Greece to Rome? It's not like was it? It's not set in stone. Like the, the Stoic philosophers have been willing to change it to to refine it. No, they they argued with each other. There were schisms within the school, so we know that there was a certain amount of flexibility in the school, and it was around for such a long time that you know, I mean, psychoanalysis is only really around for like a, you know less than a hundred years. Stoicism is five centuries, so it had to kind of evolve. And it's spread all over the place throughout the empire. But we can't, it's difficult for us to pinpoint exactly how it changed because hardly any of the early Stoic texts survive. Most of the main texts that we have, all of the main texts really come from the late Roman period, the Roman imperial era, like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and so on. So we can kind of infer that the earlier Stoics were sort of more interested in logic and stuff, and the later Stoics seem more interested in philosophy as a way of life or, or ethics, but it's not entirely clear how significant that difference is because we, we don't know that much about the early Stoics, unfortunately. So when people think of Stoicism today, they often think about the ethics, right? How to live a good life. But there was, as you said, there was, a, there was Stoic logic, there was Stoic metaphysics, a Stoic theology. I'm curious, did those things like the metaphysics of Stoics or their theology, if you want to call it that, did that influence their ethics? Yeah, it did. And, you know, like, I mean, we should say that the Stoics thought of their curriculum, like their philosophy is consisting of these three chunks, Sto like physics, ethics, and logic. And they thought of them as being closely interconnected in a number of ways. And again, we, we know more about Stoic ethics because the books that survive are mainly dealing with that aspect of Stoicism. And our knowledge of physics in Stoicism is a bit more fragmentary. Stoic logic, we only really know a few fragments about from, from other authors, really. But let's take the physics for a start. The, the, the essence of it really is that Stoics were pantheists. And that means that they believed that the whole universe, the universe in its totality, is sacred and divine. So it's a kind of more naturalistic conception of God. God isn't this kind of guy sitting in a cloud or this mysterious metaphysical being in another realm. You know, God is just the universe considered as a whole. And so they refer to that as nature 
which is also synonymous f- for them with Zeus. Zeus is just a kind of personification of nature as a whole. And so Stoicism was this kind of strange, materialistic, pantheistic, kind of slightly mystical philosophy. But one of the implications of that is that the Stoics, particularly Marcus Aurelius, think that one of the big risks that we run in life is becoming alienated or isolated from the bigger picture. So one of the goals of Stoicism is to develop a greater sense of oneness with the universe as a whole and a greater sense of kinship or oneness with the rest of humanity. And so they think that kind of underlies our our moral and our spiritual development. It's linked in with this metaphysical vision that the reality for us and what's sacred is the totality considered as a whole. There's, There's parallels there to like Eastern philosophies like Buddhism. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, from a, a modern perspective, you know, Stoicism and other Hellenistic philosophies, you know, appear like yoga or Buddhism or something like that, or other mystical religions from the East. Um, although we can also see differences between these different traditions. And then the, in terms of logic, funnily enough, having said that, the Stoics were way ahead of their time. Um, they developed a kind of propositional logic, which was only really rediscovered in the late 19th century by people like Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein, for example. So like modern logic is very indebted to the Stoics. It's really a resurgence of something they discovered nearly two and a half thousand years ago. But for them, logic was broader than what we think of as formal logic today. So it included doing the, the kind of logical, something, a precursor of what we think of as formal or propositional logic today. But it also encompassed thinking about the nature of language and reasoning in a wider sense. It also encompassed the use of language and rhetoric and understanding the relationship between thought and reality, for instance. So the way that that intersects with ethics is that the Stoics thought it was important to apply logic to everyday problems, not just use it in a kind of abstract sense. So they would practice thinking rationally and logically about moral problems that they faced on a day-to-day basis. So in a sense, Stoicism is also a philosophy that's about thinking clearly and rationally about everyday life and embracing a sort of realism and objectivity and a sense of the bigger picture in our thinking. And we'll get into the intersection of language and the ethics here in a bit, because I thought that was an interesting section you had in the book. Well, let's talk about the ethics. So you mentioned earlier the, the, the telos, right, or telos, as you know, Aristotle would say, of Stoic ethics is erite, or virtue, or excellence. Yeah. I mean, so I, I mentioned Aristotle. Was the Stoic concept of virtue, was it similar to Aristotelian virtue, or was it different? Well, from our perspective, we might see them as kind of similar, but in the ancient world, they were viewed as fundamentally competing philosophies. And one of the cool things about ancient philosophy is the, you know, people thought of different schools of philosophy as representing fundamentally different kind of perennial attitudes towards the meaning of life. So Aristotle, for instance, thought that the goal, or it seems this is what Aristotle taught anyway, certainly his students taught this, the Aristotelian school thought that the goal of life was to have a kind of combination of internal and external goods. So by internal goods, we mean strength of character, wisdom, virtue, and so on. But they also thought it was important to have friends and wealth and material possessions and stuff like that. And the Stoics question that, but they question it in a kind of subtle way. So for Stoics, external stuff is important, but it's not essential to the goal of life. So somebody can attain complete fulfillment in life, according to the Stoics, even if they're surrounded by enemies, they're sickly and persecuted and they're living in poverty. For instance, Socrates, who was persecuted politically and executed and lived in poverty. So the Stoics would say, well, giving him money and more friends and greater reputation wouldn't necessarily make Socrates' life better. In a sense, what made him a great man and what made his life so fulfilling was that he faced all these disadvantages and he engaged them with strength of character and wisdom. And and how did the Stoics figure out what was good or virtuous or what was bad or vice, right? So Aristotle had his, you know, sort of idea of using the golden mean to sort of figure out like the right thing to do at the right time for the right reason. So it's kind of situational in a way. Was the Stoic, was it a little more, I don't know what's the right word, not situational, but like sort of more of a platonic ideal that, that Socrates talked about? 
I mean, for the Stoics, there's two aspects to it. In one sense, it, it's much simpler. In another sense, it's more complex. So for the Stoics, very simply, the most important thing in any situation is to act with wisdom and justice, or to, you know, to act with virtue, moral, practical wisdom as they understand it. So our character, our intentions are the most important thing in any situation. And then whether we succeed or fail and whatever fate befalls us is relatively trivial by comparison. But what it actually means to act with wisdom and justice might vary from situation to situation. And different Stoics may actually disagree with each other about what would constitute justice in different situations. So they would say, look, you know, it may be that sometimes we can't say for certain whether it's virtuous to give money to uh, a beggar in the street or not, you know, because there's things about that we, we we might be uncertain about the outcome, for example. You know, there's, there are elements of judgments of probability and so on. It's a complex question. There's not what kind of one size fits all answer maybe. But the key thing is that we're acting with the intention fundamentally to do good and that's the overriding concern for Stoics. And how we apply that in practice is something that might be up for debate. So you mentioned earlier that so Aristotle, his idea of the good life, a flourishing life, eudaimonia, it was a combination of internal factors and external factors, right? For Aristotle, yeah. the idea was to become like this Greek gentleman, which required you to have health, wealth, reputation, etc. Yeah. The Stoics, uh, contrary to, I think, popular belief, like they weren't against those things. No. They, they just they just treated them differently. How did they how did they uh, approach those sort of external things of life? Well, they're kind of the best explanation for this in a way is in Socrates uh, in, in the dialogues that we have from Xenophon and, and Plato. In Socrates, we kind of get more arguments for some of these ideas, which we see the Stoics then putting into practice, as it were. So, and the Stoics are influenced by these arguments provided by Socrates and other earlier philosophers. So, in one of the dialogues called the Euthydemus. Socrates argues that, look, people think that wealth and friends and health and all these kind of external things constitute good fortune, like they're good things. But Socrates says, look, all of these things could be used badly by a foolish person or a vicious, a bad person. You know, money, for example, is an easy example. So in the hands of a wise and good person, money can be used philanthropically to do good and wise, prudent things. But in the hands of a foolish person, money can be used to do lots of foolish and terrible things. So these external goods are actually not really intrinsically good in themselves. They just offer us practical advantages or opportunities to exercise more control over our environment. And that could be done well or it could be done badly. And so Socrates concludes from that that the only truly good thing is wisdom itself because that determines whether we use other things well or whether we use them badly. So these external things are indifference, right? There's And, there, and there's preferred indifference. So that's like health, money, et cetera. And there's like yeah. you know unpreferred or dispreferred uh, indifference. So that'd be things like yeah. sickness or poverty. Yeah. So you don't want sickness or poverty, but you're not going to get upset if that happens or you want health and wealth, you'd prefer that, but you're not going to, you know, spend all your time and energy going after it. And also it's variable. Like we, it's, it's reasonable to pursue the preferred things and avoid the dispreferred things. So it's reasonable to pursue wealth and avoid po- poverty within certain limits, according to the Stoics. So, you know, the limitless pursuit of wealth would be irrational, according to them. And, you know, sometimes enduring poverty may actually strengthen our character. It might be a good thing. And likewise, we avoid pain. It's reasonable to do that. But sometimes enduring pain and discomfort might be good for our health. It might strengthen us, like taking cold showers and things like that might be something that people do because they think it's beneficial. Or undergoing surgery might be painful, but we do it because it's beneficial for us. So the Stoics would say it's kind of variable and we need to use reason to judge when something's preferred and when it's dispreferred, although we can make sort of broad generalizations about them. Uh, so a large part of Stoic ethics is about managing emotions. Desire is one of those emotions, anger, worry, et cetera. How did the Stoic, and this is kind of where that intersection with your uh, work as a psychotherapist comes in. How, what was the Stoic approach to emotions and what are some of the com- misconceptions people have about Stoics and emotions? Well, I guess the main misconception is that people think Stoics are unemotional. And I should probably explain, the easiest way to explain that is, you know, many terms from Greek philosophy degenerated in their meaning over time, right? And we usually denote that by using a capital letter or writing them in lowercase letters. So 
Epicureanism, with an uppercase E, capitalized, is a Greek school of philosophy that's kind of nuanced and complex. But to be an Epicurean today, with a lowercase e, just means like enjoying expensive food and stuff, like being a gourmet or whatever. So it's, it's a much more simplistic, it's almost a caricature of the original idea. And the same is true of Stoicism. When we talk about someone being Stoic today with a lowercase s, we just mean that they're kind of tough-minded, unemotional, they've got a stiff upper lip. And that's, you know, Stoicism with a capital S is, as we've seen already, this big, complex, 500-year school of philosophy that embraces physics, ethics, and logic and is much more nuanced in its approach. And actually being Stoic with a lowercase s um, not only is a simplification of what Stoicism says about emotions, but it might actually fly in the face sometimes of what the Stoics were advising. So someone who's trying to be Stoic might try to conceal or suppress painful emotions. And that's against Stoicism. The Stoics believe that the initial involuntary aspect of emotion, which they call propathei, the proto-passions or first movements, are indifferent. They're neither good nor bad. And so we should accept them as natural and kind of embrace them, let them wash over us in a sense. And what they're really concerned with is getting us to change what happens next, the way we respond to our initial emotional reactions. Do we perpetuate them? Do we amplify them? Or do we start to question them and reappraise them? And that's exactly what we do in cognitive therapy. We teach people to accept their automatic thoughts and feelings because they are outside of their direct control to like allow themselves to embrace those feelings rather than trying to deny or suppress them, but then to change how they subsequently respond to them. So, you know, when people are depressed or angry, they tend to ruminate, they dwell on negative thoughts and amplify them. But that's under voluntary control. We can stop doing that or change the way that we think about things. And the Stoics, rather than trying to eliminate all negative emotions want us, first of all, to kind of be indifferent to us and accept these automatic initial reactions. But they also want us to question our unhealthy, irrational and excessive emotions, such as extreme anger, and replace those with healthy emotions, which they call the eupathii. So love and joy and variations of those feelings, and also even a healthy feeling of shame or aversion. So they think a wise man has a natural feeling of aversion to doing things that are dishonorable or beneath him. So they think even certain painful emotions might be healthy for us and consistent with wisdom. So the, the ideal for a Stoic isn't to be unemotional. It's to rather replace unhealthy emotions with healthy ones. Was there ever an instance where the Stokes would say that maybe anger was useful? Like Aristotle would say anger is not completely useless or bad. As long as you have it in the right place at the right time for the right reason, anger can be productive. Did the Stokes have that idea or were they, they say, yeah, anger just, it's not even useful. Don't even go there. Yeah, they disagree with Aristotle. It's, it's really cool, actually, that we have this debate in the ancient world, because even today people still can argue about this a bit. So it's a, it's a cool debate. It's an interesting debate. And Seneca wrote a whole book called On Anger. The Stoics were really interested in anger. Today, psychotherapists are mainly interested in depression and anxiety, and less so in anger. But the Stoics were more interested in anger than any other emotion. Marcus Aurelius talks about it a lot. And Seneca has this whole book on it that comes down to us today. And in that book, he talks about Aristotle's idea that a certain amount of anger might be useful or healthy. And Seneca says, no, he disagrees with that idea. But he disagrees for very subtle reasons, which I kind of depend on the Stoics' definition of anger. So the Stoics define the emotions cognitively based on the underlying beliefs that shape them. And so the Stoic theory, and we, we do this in modern cognitive therapy as well, so the Stoic theory that anger, as they define it, is based on the belief that someone deserves to be punished or harmed, in other words, for a perceived injury or transgression. And, you know, it's about revenge, basically. Anger fundamentally is a desire for revenge, the Stoics would say. And they would argue that it's never rational to fundamentally want to harm another person. Now, you might punish someone in a more superficial sense if you think it's going to reform them or educate them or be in their interests. But that would be different because there your fundamental goal is actually to help the other person, to educate or improve them. But if your fundamental goal is to try and hurt them, the Stoics would think that's really what anger is about. It's harming someone for the sake of it and it's never rational or justifiable to want to do that. 
And so they say there might be things that resemble anger, but they don't fit our definition. And Seneca even at one point says, look, people, if someone comes up and punches you in the face, you're going to have, your blood pressure is going to rise and you have this kind of animal-like reaction of anger that's automatic. And Seneca says that's not really anger in the sense that we are talking about. That's an automatic reaction and we treat that as inevitable and, and natural, but we would then question how we're going to respond next and whether we want to lash out and harm the other person or whether we want to try and understand what's going on and rectify things in a rational way. Okay, so yeah, the Stoics, not against emotion, but they want people to think about it, reason with their reason their yeah. emotions out. All right, so uh, that's sort of a broad overview of Stoicism. Um, before we get into specifics, let's talk about Marcus Aurelius, because you, you, you use him, because like his book, The Meditations, has all these wonderful insights on Stoic practices that he used to be a Stoic. How did Marcus discover Stoicism? Uh, was, he origin- was, was he like b- brought up in it, or did he discover it later on when he was a young adult? Well, some of this we have to kind of infer. I mean, a lot of people who read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius don't realize that what he's talking about fits into this bigger philosophical tradition. And what what I've discovered is that a lot of people don't realize that we know some things about Marcus's life because of various Roman histories that survive, such as Cassius Dio's or Herodian's or the Historia Augusta and other sources. So we know some stuff about Marcus, as well as what he tells us in the meditations. And we know that we're told anyway that he started studying philosophy when he was 12 years old, which is an unusually early age. A Roman youth would probably only get into philosophy when they were about 15 years old normally. And Marcus got into it much earlier. And it seems that he initially really embraced philosophy as a lifestyle. He dressed like a philosopher. He slept on a camp bed on the floor like a philosopher. And he began to act like a philosopher. And we don't know what sort of philosophy he got into. It sounds like it was probably either cynicism or stoicism or something along those lines. And then we know that round about 15, he began his formal education in philosophy. We know who his teachers were because he tells us, but the histories also confirm that. And we, we, he studied under some of the most famous and important Stoic teachers of his day. He studied also the Platonic school of philosophy and Aristotelian philosophy, and he read about the Epicurean philosophy as well. So he was a very educated man, but it was only in his early 20s that he really embraced Philosophy, Stoic philosophy as a way of life that he kind of fully converted to it. And was that because of his unique situation? Because what's interesting about Marcus Aurelius, he wasn't born to be the emperor of Rome. He kind of became that through some weird adoptions, right? And like he kind of inherited the, the throne, the, the emperor title that way. Yeah, it, it wasn't really expected. It was Hadrian, the emperor Hadrian, that chose Marcus to become a future emperor as part of a kind of long-term succession plan. So there was another emperor between them. Hadrian chose Antoninus to succeed him, who we know as the emperor Antoninus Pius. And he in turn adopted Marcus Aurelius as part of this arrangement made by Hadrian. So Hadrian knew Marcus as a young boy and he originally had other plans for the succession. And then really it was about a year before Hadrian died that he suddenly changed his mind and decided I want Antoninus to succeed me and then Marcus Aurelius to succeed him. This kid, I want this kid to be the future emperor of Rome. And we don't know exactly what convinced Hadrian to do that. All we know is that Marcus said or did something at the court of Hadrian as a small child that earned him the nickname Verissimus, which means the truest, the most true. And it's a play on Marcus's family name, Verus, which means true. And Hadrian says, this kid's not just true, he's the truest of them all. And something that this boy did convinced Hadrian that he needed to put him in place as the future emperor of Rome. And I guess, did, I mean, I don't know if we know this because Marcus didn't write about it or not, but do you think that idea that he knew he was going to be an emperor, an emperor did that influence? I and mean, I imagine that probably spurred him to study Stoicism even more. Maybe he was enamored with the idea of, you know, Socrates, like philosopher kings, right? I think that was part of it, yeah. Like, he, he, we know, we're told in the histories that Marcus used to go around quoting Plato's idea that the state will only flourish when philosophers become kings or kings become philosophers, as he put it. And this is one of his favorite sayings. But we, I think maybe, like, Marcus's main teacher in Stoicism was a guy called Junius Rusticus. He's a very interesting guy in himself. And he was Marcus's right-hand man politically. He was the urban prefect 
at Rome. So he was like a kind of like a mayor. He was he was in charge of the administration in Rome. And so at Rome, Marcus is right hand man, but he was also his main Stoic mentor. And he also appears to have been a friend of Marcus's mother, Domitia Lucilla. So she was a highly educated, extremely wealthy Roman matriarch. Her husband, Marcus's birth father, had died when Marcus was only about three or four years old. So she took more responsibility for raising her son. And she seems to have known many intellectuals, to have been an educated and cultured woman. And it looks like maybe there's a hint that she was friends with Junius Rusticus. So maybe she kind of steered Marcus towards Rusticus as his main mentor or teacher in philosophy. But we also know that we're told, surprisingly, that Hadrian was friends with the Stoic teacher Epictetus. It seems kind of unlikely because Hadrian was really into sophistry and a very kind of pretentious and volatile man. So he seems exactly the sort of person that Epictetus would have warned his students against. But maybe also that Hadrian steered Marcus towards studying Stoicism. Well, okay. So let's talk about the insights about Stoicism we can glean from Marcus's uh, meditations. And going back to the idea of Stoic logic and language, you have a section on how our language can help us manage our emotions and the, the Stoic practice that we can get from that. So what, a, what what's a Stoic practice that deals with language that we can take from Marcus? Well, the main thing that the Stoics did, I mean, we, we're told a little bit about this unlikely, even in the ancient world, it was thought paradoxical that there was even a thing called Stoic rhetoric. But Zeno wrote a book on rhetoric. And it was thought odd because the Stoics were known for speaking laconically, so concisely or kind of abruptly, they used plain language, parasia in Greek. The word laconic, which we use today, comes from Laconia, the region in which Sparta was located. So the Stoics were known for speaking like Spartans. And actually the philosopher Cicero literally tells us that. We have a, a speech from Cicero where he talks about the Stoics and says that they speak and act like Spartans. So we know that the Stoics wanted to speak concisely and objectively. So they thought it was important to speak effectively and in a way that was adapted to the needs of our hearers. So we have to think about what other people need from us when we're trying to communicate with them. Uh, we, try, we need to put ourselves in their shoes and empathize with their audience. But we also need to be honest with people and avoid using flowery rhetoric, emotive language and strong value judgments. So the Stoic approach to language basically is to stick to the facts. And the term that they used to describe that is this kind of obscure technical term, fantasia cataleptica, which means having a firm grasp on reality. Sometimes it's translated as having an objective representation of things. So the Stoics practiced describing events in a very down-to-earth and objective manner, stripping away value judgments and assumptions from things. And what insights from modern, you know, behavior psychology bolster this Stoic idea that our you know, that our language can influence the way we think about reality? Well, it's certainly true. I mean, we tend today to to talk about it more in terms of clients' cognitions or their thinking. But we only know about cognition because of the words that people use to express their thoughts. And we know that people exhibit typical cognitive distortions. And the cognitive distortions that people exhibit, you know, are forms of rhetoric, basically, such as hyperbole. So people use exaggeration or hyperbole. They use overgeneralizations when they're talking about their problems. And they use metaphors to evoke emotion. So that might be useful. Like if you're giving a speech and you want to really evoke other people's emotions and stir them up, it could be useful to use flowery rhetoric and to play, uh, play on language and stuff. But the problem comes when we start doing that in our own internal thinking. So I might say to myself, well, that guy really tore a strip off me at work today. And he shot me down in flames in front of everybody else. Like I felt like a complete and utter idiot. And so there I'm using very emotive language. I'm using metaphors. I'm using generalizations. And uh, I could have just said somebody disagreed with something that I said, which is kind of seems really banal by comparison, but it's obviously much less evocative of anger and frustration and distress. And, you know, sometimes we want to do that when we're giving a powerful speech, but why on earth would we want to do that to ourselves? 
So the Stoics think we fall into this trap of using rhetoric in our own thinking, and we need to be careful to take a step back from it and practice describing things in sort of more banal, matter-of-fact and down-to-earth terms. And in doing that, we'll, we'll damp down our emotions and we'll be able to see things in a clearer way. And in fact, yeah, that's one of the things that cognitive behavioral therapists do with their clients or patients is help them start describing yeah. their problem in this more banal you know, objective frame instead of that emotion, emotive way. Yeah, we we might say things like stick to the facts. You know, just like just describe what just describe what you can actually see, like and set aside don't you know all the other kind of like flowery language and stuff, and notice you know how that makes you feel differently about things. So we'll we'll often talk in therapy about decatastrophizing. That's the kind of weird neologism that we use, and it, it it's a clunky term, but it's cool because it's. It takes a noun and turns it into a verb. So the client might say, this is a catastrophe. And the therapist might say, well, is it possible you're catastrophizing? So is it possible you're making it seem like a catastrophe because of the way that you're describing it, the way you're thinking about it, and the perspective that you adopt on it? And that makes clients realize that they've actually got more responsibility than they were assuming for the way that they perceive the situation. So when we decatastrophize a situation, we, we usually have to get clients to describe it in more prosaic and down-to-earth language. Well, yeah, an example of catastrophizing, say someone loses their job. The next step they make is like, well, my life's over. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to be go. home. And like, a therapist is like, well, just stick to the facts. What's happened? Well, you've just, well lost, everybody- you just lost your job. That's it. That's all yeah. we know. Yeah. Everybody's favorite is it's the end of the world, right? Well, you know, like it's never the end of the world, like chicken little, the sky's falling in on us, it's the end of the world, you know, or, you know, this has completely destroyed my entire life, you know, somebody might say, because they've lost their job. And, you know, I'll say very simply as an aside, as a therapist over the years, I've often been surprised by the fact that for many people being made redundant, losing their job, even being sacked from a job, maybe one of the best things that happens to them. Because otherwise, people often find themselves spending too much time in jobs that maybe aren't ideal for them. And so it might be short-term pain that they go through, but ultimately, they often end up doing something that's more fulfilling in life in many cases. So I've been surprised how often that losing a job might actually turn out to be for the best in in many people's lives. Right. So it's one of those indifference. It could be preferred or not preferred, but you never know, right? It's the same as a relationship breakup, right? I mean, it seems like the end of the world, like when you're with someone you love and then the relationship comes to an end, especially if it ends badly. But then maybe sometime later you'll meet somebody else and have an even better relationship that you would never had the opportunity for if the previous one hadn't ended. Who can know what the future holds? You don't. You know, those aren't facts. So you just don't worry about it, right? That's what the Stoics would say. So another, we mentioned like the parallels between Eastern philosophies and stoicism uh stoics had a form of meditation yeah that they would do and marcus describes it what does a stoic meditation look like well what they didn't do as far as we know is kind of sit cross-legged and wear sandals and burn incense and focus on their breathing and chant and stuff like so we don't mean meditation in that kind of cliched sense but even when we're studying oriental religions or philosophy the the concept of meditation is much broader than that anyway so that's really a kind of caricature an oversimplification of what meditation looks like so we're talking about meditation in a slightly broader sense so for stoics there are many contemplative practices that might be verbal they might involve visualization or they might involve more kind of abstract conceptual thinking and they're, they're a little bit different from what people might think of as meditation but when people start practicing them it becomes clear that it is a kind of meditative exercise. And the Stoics did them in a systematic, regular way. They talk about doing them on a daily basis or frequently throughout the day or every evening or in response to certain situations. So Marcus is always telling himself, you know, each day remind yourself to contemplate your own death, for example, or to think of each day as as if it were your last. Or another Stoic exercise we call prosoche in Greek, which means paying attention. And it involves continually paying attention to the way that you're using your mind, particularly your value judgments, and how those are interacting with your emotions and your desires. So it's kind of like Buddhist mindfulness in some ways. The Stoics had a similar concept. But the other one that's popular in Stoicism, which is kind of unlike most meditation practices today, we call the view from above, Hado, 
who I mentioned earlier, coined the term the view from above for it. And that involves the Stoics trying to picture the whole of space and time and their place within it, which obviously is impossible to do, right? But we can grasp the concept in a way. We can think about the bigger picture to some extent. So the Stoics would practice doing that in a number of different ways, broadening their awareness and broadening their perspective. And again, like we mentioned much earlier, that's kind of linked into the whole of Stoic physics and the fact that they were pantheists and believed the totality of the universe was the ultimate reality and was sacred and divine. So they'd rehearse v- picturing events from high above, for instance. So the Stoic meditations, there, there are different types, but it seems like the, the common theme is one is to see the big picture, which would yeah. like that sort of distancing helps you uh, make your problems that you have not seem so big. It puts it in perspective, but also it seems like there's a lot of reflection going on and seeing where, where you can improve, where your faults are and how you can do better the next day. Well, actually, maybe worth it, just as an aside, you know, there's a passage in Marcus Aurelius where he says something really cool. He says that most of what he's talking about can be summed up in, in, in Greek six words, like short words, a little phrase the cosmos is change, life is opinion. And those two little statements refer to two of his favorite philosophers. So one is Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, who said, Pantare, everything flows, the river of time. So Heraclitus said that the universe is constantly changing, everything is in flux. And it's from him that Stoics get their physics and this idea of pantheism. And so Marcus says uh, the universe has changed in order to remind him of the transience of things, like a bit like the Buddhist doctrine of um, impermanence. And the Stoics, in many different ways, when they're looking at the bigger picture, are also focusing on the smallness and transience of the current problems that we're facing. And they think we become less distressed by events when we adopt that kind of perspective. And the other bit, life is opinion, uh, refers to Epictetus's ideas that it's not things that upset us, but our opinions or judgments about them. And that's the Stoic idea that we need to become more aware of our opinions, prosoke, pay attention to them and take responsibility for the way that our value judgments are distorting our perception of events and shaping our emotions. So Marcus says the gist of the, the, everything he's saying is encapsulated in, in these two little techniques, basically. So this, one of the emotions that the Stoics thought a lot about on how to manage is desire, because desire can lead to vice and frustration and whatnot, what have you. Um, and I thought it was interesting. I was just reading in Romans this week, uh, the Apostle Paul, who probably studied Stoicism. You see some Stoic influence in some of his writings. He, he talks about wanting to do good, but he doesn't do it, the good he wants to do, because you know, he has this vice inside of him. because The desire for temptation is so strong. I thought that was a very Stoic thing that I read as preparing for this conversation. How did the Stoics, what did the Stoics say about changing our desires or or moderating our desires so it, it lines up with virtue? Well, let me digress for a second, actually, and just say something about Paul. I think it helps to put Stoicism in a historical context to say that you can view Stoicism as one of the main precursors of early Christian ethics. And uh, one modern scholar actually called St. Paul a crypto-Stoic, a secret Stoic. So, the, you know, there are obvious Stoic influences on Christianity, particularly the idea of the brotherhood of man, so that very much was in a concept that was associated with Stoicism. And you can see that running all the way through the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, you know, more associated with Stoicism than most other philosophical schools. But St. Paul, just as a little bit of trivia, a little aside, not a lot of people know this, but in the Acts of the Apostles, we're told that St. Paul went to a place in Athens called the Areopagus and that he actually spoke to a group of Stoic and Epicurean philosophers And he quoted uh, a poem from one of the early Greek Stoics, a guy called Aratus, approvingly to them. So he definitely knew Stoics and talked to them about philosophy and stuff. He was talking to them actually about Stoic pantheism. That's what the poem was about that he was quoting. So that that kind of aside, a little bit of history that might be of interest to some people. What do the Stoics say about desires? Sometimes Stoic therapy is called the therapy of desire by modern scholars. Because desire is really central. The desire is one of the passions for Stoicism. The Greek term for passion encompasses both what we would call desires and emotions. And the Stoics think our desires can become excessive, irrational, 
unhealthy and they can lead us into vice. So we have to be careful to take a step back from them. And the key for Stoics is awareness. It's about spotting our desires at the earliest possible stage so that we can nip them in the bud if it turns out that they are unhealthy or destructive. And the way to deal with that is to think about their consequences more carefully, more patiently, and more vividly. So the Stoics are always telling us to kind of picture in our mind's eye where our desires are going to lead us in the longer term. And that's something that we do in modern therapy as well. It's similar to what we call functional analysis, getting clients to think about what would happen if you indulge certain desires over the long term, and then what would happen if you exercised more discipline is almost like a fork in the road and two paths that diverge further and further over time. And the other thing the Stoics would do would be to role model wise and good people to think about the people that you most admire in life and how they would deal with similar desires because most of us tend to admire people that exercise self-discipline although we you know we're more lax in exercising it ourselves so one of the main themes of stoicism is to train ourselves to become more like the sort of people that we admire in life and because the stoics think of it as being a kind of hypocrisy in a way to admire self-disciplined people, but not to be self-disciplined ourselves. And they want us just to be more consistent in our morality, more consistent in our thinking by being more like the sort of people that we typically praise and admire. So modeling other people is another way of coping with desire and stoicism. What about anxiety and worry? Worry, That seems like something, a topic that Marcus wrote a lot about in his meditations. Yeah, I mean, the Stoics are very concerned with fear and anxiety and worry. And so some of the things that they would talk about would be, for example, like we mentioned earlier, decatastrophizing. So in modern therapy, like that's one of the main techniques that we use today. Worry is absolutely a, a particular style of thinking as it's defined in modern psychology. Uh, we call it what if thinking, you know, what if this just ends in a disaster? What if I can't cope? So what if thinking is very deeply associated with catastrophizing or kind of exaggerating how bad things are going to be and underestimating our ability to cope. And the Stoics want us to question that, to take a step back from it and re-describe things in more objective and down-to-earth language. But they also want, want us to notice when we're beginning to worry and postpone it. So Epictetus says, take a step back like withhold judgment for a while until you've calmed down and you can think through things more clearly at your leisure. And we call that worry postponement today. It's one of the most effective techniques in the cognitive therapy of worry and anxiety. So learning to spot when we're starting to worry and catastrophize and taking a kind of time out from it and saying, wait a minute, I'm going to come back and think about this a few hours from now or later in the evening when I've calmed down a little bit and I'm able to think about it more clearly and to problem solve uh, in a more rational way. And another tactic that Stoics use or sort of a, a meditation is to look at the big picture or say that this is the way things are, it's fate or nature yeah. and getting upset about it doesn't change it. So don't get upset about it. Yeah. And when we look at the bigger picture, as I mentioned earlier, it, it tends to make things seem smaller in scope and also more transient. Like it's just a moment in our life. This too shall pass. So it's linked in with this idea of the impermanence of the transience of things. Just as an aside, in modern therapy, we notice like when people are worrying and catastrophizing, it's, it's almost like an interesting puzzle, the way that thinking works in some situations. So, you know, if you're thinking about losing your job, for instance, or at the end of a relationship. You know, that's a sequence of events, right? And you could, it's like a little movie clip in your mind, and you could choose to focus on any particular part of it in the chronological sequence. But when people are worrying, they tend to obviously focus on the scariest part of it, the most upsetting part, and kind of stop there and go round and round that bit. And we find in therapy that very simply, if we sometimes say to people, well, what would probably happen next? And then get them to kind of answer that question and then keep asking it. And then what would probably happen? And then what would probably happen? Well, if I broke up with my girlfriend, it'd be just catastrophic. It'd be the end of the world. Well, what would probably happen next? Well, I'd probably feel really depressed and I'd kind of stay at home and I wouldn't go out. And then what would probably happen after that? Well, I guess I'd start to think about socializing again and meeting other people. And then what would probably happen next? Well, I guess I'd probably meet another girl and form another relationship and so on. So when we get people to move forward, 
in a kind of patient, systematic manner, it, it tends to damp down the initial anxiety and they view things in a more balanced way. And also they start to think more about ways of coping. Whereas when people are worrying, they tend to just tell themselves that they can't cope. And, you know, the stoic technique of thinking of things in terms of a wider context, I think serves a similar purpose. It forces us to realize that the perceived catastrophes that happen to us are temporary and that we have to move on from them. And that seems less overwhelming. This idea of Stoic acceptance, is it, is it fatalism? Like were the Stoics, did the Stoics say, well, that's just the way things are. There's nothing you can do about it. Or was their fatalism different from that that passive fatalism? Yeah, like the, the idea of the Stoic is a kind of passive doormat that just sits in his hands and stays at home. Is it the stay-at-home Stoic, right? Well, that's a caricature of Stoicism. And, you know, one of the reasons that I wrote How to Think Like a Roman Emperor is that I found when I've been teaching Stoicism, I mean, I've been teaching Stoicism and writing about it for, I think it's probably just over 20 years now. And time and time again, I've found that these kind of misconceptions of Stoicism come up. Like it's about being unemotional. It's about being kind of passive and inert. And you can argue with people about that by referring to the texts or the philosophical doctrines. But actually the easiest way to dispute it is just to point at a Stoic like Marcus Aurelius or Cato or Zeno and say, do these guys seem like they were passive doormats? Like, obviously they weren't. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius was a workaholic, if anything. He put himself at the front line in commanding the largest army ever assembled on a Roman frontier. We think the, the, the Roman legions along the Danube during the Marcomannic Wars numbered maybe 140,000 men in total, the, the legions and the auxiliary units combined. That's a huge army. And he'd never served in the military before. But even as a sickly man with many health problems in his 40s, he rode out from Rome, put on his general's uniform, went to a foreign country for the first time, to modern-day Austria, and took command of this huge army, staking everything on it. So he wasn't this kind of fatalistic, passive, stay-at-home type, quite the opposite. Stoics were committed to action in the service of wisdom and justice. But the, the thing about Stoicism is that it teaches us how to reconcile a commitment to determined action in the service of our fundamental values and principles with emotional acceptance so that we don't become upset if we encounter setbacks or we're thwarted along the way. Because the Stoics think that the most important thing is to have the intention to do good in the world while simultaneously accepting the fact that we might not succeed or that we might encounter resistance or setbacks along the way and not to kind of get upset or feel overwhelmed if that happens. Now, that's explained famously by Cicero. Cicero wasn't a Stoic. He was a follower of the, the academic school of philosophy that was founded by Plato. But Cicero, a famous Roman orator, who lived centuries earlier than Marcus, was a very educated man and he'd studied Stoicism at Athens. And he tells us that the Stoics explained this as being like a man throwing a spear or an archer. And he focuses on throwing the spear at the target to the best of his ability. And whether he actually hits the target or not is in the hands of fate. Once the spear is flown, if he's throwing it at a wild boar, for example, you know, it might dart in the opposite direction and he might miss it. But his only goal is to throw the spear in this most skillful way that he possibly can and then to be relatively indifferent to whether he actually hits the target or not, simply to do the best insofar as that's within his power. But in order to try his best, he has to have a target to aim at. And that's how the Stoics view the goal of benefiting humanity. They have to have that goal in order to aim at something constructive and meaningful in life, to have a sense of purpose in life, but they mustn't demand success. They have to be relatively accepting uh, of the fact that they might fail or encounter setbacks along the way. That's a tight, that's a tough rope to walk. It's, it, there's like a tension there that I think could be really... Yes, a balancing act, right? Right. Because, you know, you, you, you have to do your best, but not be attached to the results. But like the results are often like what spurs you or motivates you to do your best. But you, you have to like take a step back and not do that. And that, that can be tricky. Those are the preferred indifference in Stoicism, which is kind of misleading language. The Stoics also say that those things have value or axia in Greek. So those are things that we value, that we want to achieve, 
But, you know, as soon as we fail to achieve them, the Stoics say they become completely indifferent to us. It's like water off a duck's back, as it were. So the Stoics should just kind of shrug that off and move on to the next thing. But nevertheless, while we're aiming for them, they do have a certain type of limited importance or value. And we have to assign that value to things in order to motivate ourselves and to have something to focus on. But the value that we assign to hitting the target should never be so much that it would distress us if we miss. Like We shouldn't place so much value on it that we throw a tantrum like or get upset if things don't go as we would have desired. And we should never place more value on obtaining those externals than we place on our own strength of character uh, and our own wisdom and virtue. Wisdom and virtue always trumps the value that we place on externals. And that's like the Stoics basically saying we should never sell out for wealth or reputation or whatever. We should never be willing to sacrifice our own character and integrity, no matter how, how much is at stake externally. Well, how, did, how does the Stoic deal with, like, say, trying to extinguish an injustice in the world, right? The Stoics were about justice, but in the process of saying fighting some injustice, they might have setbacks. You know, like, how would the Stoics, like, they say, just don't get upset, just keep trying? Was that, would that be their... They're, they're well, afraid. Ryan Hall, he says, you know, he, he paraphrases one of the passages in the meditations for his book, The Obstacle is Away. And that's, that's exactly what the Stoics mean. So when we encounter an obstacle, it now becomes a new opportunity for us to exercise virtue. You know, we flow around it like water is kind of how the Stoics envisage it. Or as Marcus says, the mind of the wise man is like a blazing fire and obstacles are just like more fuel, more wood that's thrown on the fire and it consumes them. So for the Stoic, if he encounters a setback when he's trying to act in the service of justice, he needs to just accept the reality of it, accept his situation, and then he decides what would constitute wisdom and justice in responding to the new situation. So he just adapts and then tries to act with virtue and integrity in face of the new, in the face of the new situation that he's now encountering. Well, Donald, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book? Well, they, if they want to find more about the stuff that I do, my website is just my name. It's Donald Robertson, all one word, dot name, not dot com. Or I have a lot of free courses and downloads as well that people can do. And that's just on my e-learning site, which is just the subdomain learn. So it's learn dot Donald Robertson dot name. And the main books that I've written, I've written six books, but the, the ones in Stoicism are how to think like a Roman emperor, the one we've been talking about, the Stoic philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, and also a teach yourself book called Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. That they, they can find these books on Amazon or any online bookstore. And also the more academic book that I wrote for therapists and philosophers is called The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And that goes more deeply into the, the relationship with psychotherapy and the, the history of uh, Stoicism and psychotherapy. Fantastic. Well, Donald Robertson, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Brett. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. My guest today was Donald Robertson. He's the author of the book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, donaldrobertson.name, or also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Marcus, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.